This is part two in the series of graphical linear programming. In our previous video, we formulated this class example problem. There's the formulation and the graph. Next, I'd like to introduce three different approaches you could use to solve the graphical LP. First of all, previously we determined that the feasible region is this shaded area right here. What Danzig figured out back in 1947 was that the optimal solution to an LP formulation uh, has to be an extreme point. So in this graph we've got four extreme points, these four right here. Of course, the origin doesn't make much sense for a solution because that would be producing zero variables and zero chairs and having a, a profit of, of zero. So realistically then, the, pro the uh, profit should be maximized either at this point, this point, or this point. Special case would be somewhere in between. But it would never be at a point like this here in the middle of the feasible region. So the first approach then is to plug all the extreme points into the objective function and see which one has the highest profit. This point here is 15 tables and zero chairs. So if we plug 15, zero, 15 and zero into the objective function, we see that that would provide us with a profit of 60. Likewise, this solution right here, zero tables and 12 chairs, when we plug that into the objective function, zero and 12, we get a z of 36. So that's clearly not the optimal. This one might be. The other extreme point is this one right here. Uh, but first we have to figure out where that point is. It's at the intersection of the two constraints, but you better not eyeball it based on my graph because it's off. So what you can do is solve those two constraints simultaneously. Remember how to do this back in eighth grade algebra? We've got our two constraints. Set them equal to the 60 and the 48 now. And one way to do it is the addition and subtraction method, which you can multiply uh, through by, say, for example, minus 2. If we multiply that through, that would become minus 4. And then when we add these two together, that variable will drop out. So minus 2 times the whole thing gives us minus 8x1 minus 4x2 is equal to minus 120. Add that together with this, the second constraint. And again, the x2s drop out. We get minus 6x1 is equal to minus 72. Solving for x1, then is 12. To get the value of x2, you just plug the 12 then back up into any one of the three equations, and you'll find that x2 is equal to 6. So that's 12, 6 at that point. The other method that you might have learned is the substitution approach, where you could just solve for one variable and then plug it in to the other equation and then solve for the other variable. That works too. Either way you prefer. Okay, so now, um, yeah, 12, 6 is that point, 12 tables and 6 chairs. And when we plug that point back into the original objective function, 12 uh, and 6, 12 and 6 added together provides a z of 66. So that's the optimal point right there. Now, this is a fine way to do it. Um, it could turn into a lot of work, especially if, for example, you have a graph that looks like this, where these are greater than or equal to constraints, and then some less than or equal to constraints. Okay, if you've got all these extreme points here in this feasible region, you're not going to want to solve each one of those simultaneously and plug them into the objective function. It's too much work. So the second approach. The second approach, what you do is you arbit arbitrarily plot the objective function. Take a look at it, and then based on your look, you can determine where the optimal point is. Now, I say arbitrarily. Um, what you do is you set this equal to something, and, and you've got to be in the ballpark. So uh, I set it equal to 70 arbitrarily, just because 10 and 10 would put us in the ballpark at this point right here. Um, you wouldn't want to set it equal to 1, for example, because then your, your plot would be way down there. You want to want to set it equal to 1,000 because you'd be off the graph, and that doesn't help. So if we set it some, to something, you know, within this range, and then take a look, that'll help us to figure out where the optimal solution is. So I said 70 because 10, 10, 10, 10 gives us 70. 
and also 0, 23.3, 0, and then I'll just put a dashed line through those points. And you can see I just missed the, the, uh, the, the optimal solution. Just missed it. So what you can do then is bring it in, and the first point it touches is you enter the feasible region as optimal. Or if you've plotted it here, inside, if I'd set it equal to like 50 or something, it's the last point as we leave the feasible region that's optimal. So that's the optimal point. Then the next step would be, you know, to, again, calculate the 12.6, plug it into the objective function with a z of 66. That might save you some time of having to plug all of the points in. The third approach is the, my personal favorite, is to compare the slope of the objective function to the slope of the constraints. Okay? And then based on that comparison, you can figure out where the optimal solution is. So what is the slope of the objective function? Well, it turns out the slope of the objective function is just minus C1 over C2, where C1 is 4 and C2 is 3. So the slope of the objective function is minus 4 thirds. Just take this one over that one, put the negative sign on it, and you got it. Likewise, you can do that same trick on the constraints. The slope of this first constraint is minus 4 over 2, or minus 2. The slope of the second constraint is minus 2 over 4, or minus 1 half. So, then what you can do is make a number line, like this and put the slope minus one half of the constraints and minus two and then the slope of the objective function recall was minus four over three that's the objective slope see where it falls well it falls in between there doesn't it minus four over three is minus one and one third so that's about right here it's clearly in between minus one half and minus 2. So what that tells you is the slope of the objective function is in between the slope of these two constraints. So therefore, as we move it out, the last point we touch is we leave the feasible region as 12, 6. Or the first point we touch as we come in to the feasible region here is 12, 6. The slope of the objective function is in between there. Now, Notice that if the slope of the objective function had been steeper than the steepest constraint, then this would be the optimal point out here. So, for example, if the slope of the objective function had been minus 3, steeper than the steepest constraint, then that would be the optimal point. Or, if it had been flatter than the flattest constraint, if the slope of the objective function, say, for example, was minus uh, 1 fourth, flatter than the flattest constraint, then the optimal solution would have been right there. But since we were exactly in between, then the optimal point is, is defined by those two constraints. So that's the third way to figure out where the optimal solution is. In the next video, we're going to talk about some special cases and define binding versus non-binding constraints. We'll talk to you then.